Well, if you'd be turning to Psalm 24, please. Psalm 24. And um, we're going to read the whole chapter because it's not very long. Uh, Before we do, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word. And thank you, Lord, for the way in which... uh, uh, the worship has really prepared the way tonight, Lord, in, in how you've led us in uh, considering you. And we pray we would bear those things in mind and that you would take those things further, Lord, as we come to your word now. Um, perhaps discussing simple things, perhaps things which we've heard a lot before, but we pray you might have new life to us. Um, and uh, we might have a desire to respond, Lord. Uh, so teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 24 and verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Well, we're not going to look at the whole of that passage uh, tonight. Um, We're just going to look really at um, a few verses One of the um, difficulties I'm finding at the moment as I'm starting out uh, uh, in in this work is I keep wondering if something I am looking at has been spoken on recently. And I just have this sneaky feeling, sneaky feeling? Uh, Well, whatever the word is, I have this feeling that something of this might have been covered before. Um, But uh, if it has, then I hope this is uh, fresh and new. Um, But we're going to look at uh, really verses 3 to 5 this evening. Um, and uh, the reason I've been looking at this psalm is um, actually uh, uh, it was something that really spoke to me uh, a week or so ago, two weeks ago, um, as I was thinking about um, the the Sunday when I was going to be uh, set aside, as it were, and um, throughout that week leading up to it, this psalm had a real significance to me, which I'll probably go into a bit later. Um, which is, so that's why uh, we're looking at it tonight, because it's been speaking to me ever since then. Um, and although we're looking at uh, verses 3 to 5 tonight, it's important to remember what comes before. That the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. We've been thinking in the worship tonight uh, about how great our God is. Um, and um, about uh, the need to recognise him as exalted in our lives, uh, in the whole world. Um, And so that's the context tonight as we come to look at uh, coming into the Lord's presence and and who can do that, Um, that it's not just the presence of some random person, it's not just the presence of some um, great king on earth, it's the presence of the exalted one. And so uh, we need to bear that in mind when we come to this. He created the world, as it says in verse 2, and everything and everyone in it, which means he owns the world and everything and anyone in it. So he he has a rightful uh, hold upon our lives uh, if we'll only submit to it. So, verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? Now, the phrase hill of the Lord only appears once in Scripture, at least in in, in my version, um, and no prize for recognising that's here. Um, So this is the one place it it appears. But the phrase holy hill 
or God's holy hill, or his holy hill, or your holy hill, speaking to the Lord, appears several times in the Psalms. Um, so uh, there's clearly a pattern here that, that there is this hill. Um, and the question, therefore, is what hill is David talking about? What hill is he talking about? Now, the temple wasn't built at this point. Uh, because David is speaking, obviously Solomon built the temple, uh, Lord David made preparations for it, he didn't build it. Um, so he's not speaking about the temple. And uh, the tabernacle or the tent of meeting uh, that um, was made during Moses' uh, time, uh, at least as I understand it, also wasn't at Jerusalem at this point. Um, I stand to be corrected on any or all of this later, but uh, as I understand it, um, it started off in Shiloh. When it went after they'd come over um, from Egypt, started off in Shiloh. Uh, that's where Elkanah and Hannah went up with the rest of Israel to sacrifice yearly. It's where Eli served as high priest. Um, and the Ark of the Covenant was there until the Israelites sent for it to use it as a lucky charm in one of their battles with the Philistines. Um, and of course, the Ark was then captured, spent time with the Philistines briefly. And then spent 20 years in Kirjath Jirim, or Kirjath Jirim, or Hammer Wigan, pronounce it how you will. Um, so he spent 20 years there until David eventually fetched it from there and took it to Jerusalem. At some point in this time, the tabernacle seems to have moved to Gibeon. Um, the tabernacle, because uh, it talks about. Um, the, uh, when David brought the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem, he pitched a tent, which is confusingly called a tabernacle uh, as well. He pitched a tabernacle. Um, but there's actually a passage in 1 Chronicles 16 that speaks about both places. Uh, we're not going to turn to it for time, but please do look at it uh, in your own time. Uh, in 1 Chronicles 16, it talks about um, the tent and the people who served at the tent in Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant uh, and the people who offered sacrifices at the altar uh, of the tabernacle in Gibeon. Um, I'm just trying to kind of uh, give it a bit of uh, background here. Um, but either way, even if I got any of that wrong, um, the point is Jerusalem is on a hill uh, to some extent. Um, one day I, I would love to be able to go there to verify this personally, but uh, I believe it's on a hill. Um, and we can assume that the tabernacle at Gibeon was on a hill uh, because it's described in several places as the high place that was at Gibeon. So either way, whether, um, whether the, it's the tabernacle uh, at Jerusalem or at Gibeon, um, he could be speaking about this place where the tabernacle is pitched. And of course, if it's a hill, then people go up, don't they? People go up to the tabernacle, they go up to the holy, uh, the holy place. Um, so he could be thinking about ascending the hill of the Lord, the physical hill, going up to um, Jerusalem. I do wonder though whether perhaps he, he could also or instead be speaking metaphorically about generally entering the Lord's presence. Um, and uh, I, was, I was thinking uh, about Moses and Moses went up Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord. In fact if you turn to Exodus we can look at that uh, in Exodus 19. Exodus 19 and uh, verse 10. This is um, after the Lord has said that he's going to appear uh, in the thick cloud on the mountain uh, as a sign to um, the people of Israel. And in verse 10, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people. And sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, 
that there were thunderings and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long, and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. I read the whole of that section because it shows the preparation that was there for the, for the Lord to meet with, with his people and the warnings that were there about not touching the mountain. So even the general congregation who weren't actually going to go up into the hill of the Lord had to be consecrated. They had to cleanse themselves. They had to keep themselves clean for that period. Let alone Moses who was going to actually go up the mountain into the Lord's presence. And it's quite an awesome picture. Uh, it must have been an awesome sight to be there, uh, to hear this loud trumpet, to see a mountain covered in smoke uh, and, uh, and lightnings and thunder in the morning. I'd, I'd only just noticed, you know, sometimes you don't notice things and suddenly occurred to me, oh, wow, this is actually in the morning. This is happening. I kind of picture it at night. Uh, well, maybe it was that dark, we don't know, but certainly um, it would have been very, very unusual. Um, and so there's this amazing sight, and the Lord comes down to the mountain. But only Moses, at least at this point, only Moses goes up. Uh, because God calls him. Moses doesn't just arrogantly decide to go up to the mountain. God calls Moses and says, Moses, come up. And God warned that if anybody else touched the mountain, they would die. They were to be put to death. Um, but Moses was accepting the Lord's sight. And I wonder if, thinking about the verses we're going to look at later in, in this Psalm 24, if it's part, at least partly because of Moses' heart. And the fact that Moses' heart was right before the Lord. Whereas perhaps most of the people of Israel weren't, given that they were all going to go over to an idol um, just days or, or weeks later. Uh, and the Lord saw that perhaps. Um, yeah, so the idea is that uh, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord. And so perhaps Moses, perhaps David was thinking about this uh, when, he, when he was writing this. It's perhaps. Um, and um, uh, either way really, um, whether he was thinking about um, uh, metaphorically or he was thinking of a literal hill uh, that he went up. Um, of course, we don't have a tabernacle now. Um, we don't have to go to one single place uh, to meet with the Lord. Um, we can come at any time and in any place in prayer and meet with the Lord. Though, of course, just like Moses, we would have to be cleansed from our sins in order to have that real fellowship with the Lord. And we'd have to come with the right attitude. But we've not got those limitations that David did at that time. And whatever he was thinking of, there is this recognition that the Lord is high and lifted up. Um, because uh, it, whoever is, is uh, going to be into the Lord's presence is ascending, going up the hill of the Lord. Um, and of course, there were high places uh, in Israel um, for worship, sadly for idol worship sometimes. But there were these high places. Um, and so this is recognition that when we come to the Lord... He is high and lifted up, um, which is why it was great to see the way the worship was going tonight um, and talk about the Lord being exalted um, and being exalted in our lives. And uh, so he should be. So we have the phrase, the hill of the Lord, um, just some thoughts on what it might mean. And it also talks about um, standing in the holy place. Um, and uh, again, this could be talking about the, the being at the, the uh, tabernacle, um, at that uh, symbol of the Lord's presence, or it could just be uh, being close to the Lord. Um, but either way, um, if the place is holy, then those standing in it need to be holy too. 
Um, and uh, so uh, it struck me when it says about the, the Lord's holy place um, that uh, anybody who wants to enter into it must be holy. Anybody who wants to enter a secure site must be secure. Anybody who wants to enter um, a forensic uh, investigation area has to be clean. Um, and, uh, and so on. There's, there's so many pictures out there. Um, but a holy place needs holy people to stand in it. And the presence of the Lord is holy. And of course, we don't have um, a physical tabernacle. So we've not necessarily got the awe of thinking, oh, wow, I'm stepping over this threshold. I'm stepping into the Lord's presence. And uh, perhaps uh, in Israel's time, I can see the Shekinah glory. I can see all uh, the glory there. So, wow, this is awesome in a sense. We don't have that. Um, we haven't got anything we can see and touch. And so maybe it's easier for us to come to the Lord's presence uh, glibly uh, or lightly. But actually, just like those Israelites who would have come to the tabernacle and recognised something of what they were doing, um, that when we come in our times of worship here, as well as at home, um, which is partly why we have the times of preparation upon the, the board before the meeting starts, that we take time to think that we are coming into the presence of the exalted one. Um, and anyone who comes into the presence of the exalted one must be holy, must be clean in order to really enter that presence. Um, in order to really enter into worship, perhaps, mm. uh, we need to be clean. So there we go. So that was uh, verse three uh, of Psalm 24. Um, if you've gone back there now. Verse four, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. And there's uh, four uh, requirements uh, here for the person who comes into the Lord's presence, uh, which seem to represent different things. Um, we won't consider them all in particular detail. There's one or two I want to consider more than others. But uh, clean hands it seems to represent righteousness and the absence of sin. Uh, we, we talk in... Uh, in, in our culture, don't we, about having uh, clean hands if somebody's innocent um, or getting their hands dirty if they've gone involved in crime in some way. Um, we talk about people having blood on their hands um, if they have either killed somebody or through something they have done has caused somebody, caused somebody to die. Uh, Pilate washed his hands to claim he was innocent of Jesus' death. Um, and so having clean hands, uh, we would generally think of as being that we are innocent, that we are free from sin. If we are to enter the Lord's presence, we need to have those clean hands. And um, there's various places where it talks about uh, clean hands. Um, Psalm 26 verse 6 says, I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord. Again, that reminder that to come to the Lord's altar, our hands must be clean. And of course, the priests, when they came to serve at the tabernacle, um, had, uh, as Ray has uh, mentioned recently, had to cleanse themselves, um, wash themselves before they could come into the Lord's presence. Um, a symbol of the need to be uh, clear from their sin. And um, in Ephesians 4 verse 28, Paul says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands, what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Slightly different perhaps, but again that reminder that what we work with our hands, um, or what we do generally, um, must be innocent. And of course, we can never fully live up to that um, as human beings, that we can live a perfect life at all times. But again, isn't that what we thought about this morning uh, in our worship? That the Lord is willing to forgive us. That the Lord is willing to wipe that slate clean when we come to him. And so when we have these times of preparing for our worship and the, the sign is on the, the projector or whatever and we, we come to sit down. Um, one thing perhaps we haven't mentioned is to say to get right with the Lord. Um, and to make sure our hands are clean so that we can come into his presence um, to examine ourselves. So we've got clean hands. But perhaps the, the one that's spoken to me the most uh, recently is uh, a pure heart. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. 
Uh, now our heart is the seat of our desires and our attitudes. Um, uh, when God looks at our hearts, he sees what we want and why we want it. What we like and why we like it. It's where our desires are seated. And uh, the Bible has a lot to say about the heart. I'm sure you can think of some verses. Uh, here is the interactive part of the message. Uh, if anybody can think of any verses to do with the heart, shout them out, please. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Yes. All those sins come from the heart. Yes, absolutely. We will use that verse. Thank you, Ben. Yes, indeed, as Asha said. Yes, absolutely. Um, so so uh, the, our, all these sins come from our hearts. Um, there are loads. Um, and I was in the, the position where I, I saw all these verses I want to mention. And um, I'm only going to mention about 100, so it's all right. Um, but uh, no, we, there's all these verses. <coughs> uh, there's all these verses that, that, that we could mention uh, to do with the heart. Um, but we won't for time. Um, but I will mention a few. Uh, Matthew 5 verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And of course, purity, being pure, means undefiled, uncontaminated. Uh, we see in scripture that the heart can be hard. Pharaoh's heart was hard um, against the Israelites. It can also be willing. Those of a willing heart gave to the work of the tabernacle when it was being made. Uh, the Israelites were told in Deuteronomy that they were to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength. And perhaps that's where um, it, it reminds us that the heart isn't just about emotions and, and feelings. Um, because it doesn't say, um, pray that your emotions would one day turn to the Lord and that one day you would just magically start to like him. He doesn't say that, does it? It's a command. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Um, and so um, we don't need to sit around thinking, oh, I hope one day my heart changes. Uh, I hope one day I, I just suddenly switch to becoming loving of the Lord. Um, and uh, we will talk about the Lord changing hearts later. But um, there is a command sometimes we can't just wait for our hearts to magically change. Sometimes we have to say, no, I will Love the Lord. I will make sure my heart is, is right before the Lord. Um, with all our soul and all our strength. And of course um, Samuel told Saul that the Lord uh, would not allow his kingdom to continue. Because he sought for himself a man after his own heart. So the Lord has a heart that he is looking for others to have a similar heart to him. And there's a verse you probably, some of you probably thought about just a minute ago. Uh, when I was asked about verses to do with the heart. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7. Not that you might have thought of the reference. But, you know, no. but the Lord said to Samuel. Do not look at his appearance. Or at his physical stature. Because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. And so it's not enough just to be doing the right things. It's not enough just to have clean hands. To be getting everything right outwardly. Uh, it's not enough just to be saying the right things to others. To be doing works for the Lord um, on its own. To be serving in the church on its own. If the heart isn't right, then God isn't pleased. And we can all get like that sometimes, can't we? We can all... Um, Get into um, the habit of serving in different ways and, and doing things, whether it be for the body here or for our families or our friends um, or work or wherever. We get in the habit of doing the right things. But sometimes we take, if we take a moment, we, we can think actually our attitudes aren't right in what we're doing. We've become... Um, uh, Grum we've started to grumble in our, in, in, within us about the things we have to do. We've um, become, to, become a bit lax and, and, and lost the fire and the desire to really help people. Um, you know, it, it's good sometimes to take stock and thinking, of course, am I doing the right things? But also, are my attitudes behind doing those things right? Um, am I doing those things just because I have to or because I've always done them or because people expect me to or... Um, or anything else or, or am I doing it because I want to please the Lord 
and I want to love others. So we need to examine our, our heart as well as our actions. And if you just uh, turn briefly to James, um, I'm aware that we're going to be studying James as a church uh, on our Wednesday night meetings. But I couldn't help but look at something in James which uh, speaks into this passage. Um, in James chapter 4 and verse 8. James 4 verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And it, it's striking, isn't it? I don't know if James was thinking of this earlier passage when writing it. But he deals with the issue of clean hands and a pure heart. Of course, for clean hands, it talks about sinning or being sinners. Um, but for purifying of hearts, it speaks about being double-minded, having two minds. Um, and that's partly what being pure is, isn't it? Being solely devoted in our hearts to the Lord rather than partly to the Lord and partly to other things. Um, if part of us wants to do things for the Lord and part of us wants to do things for ourselves, then we are double-minded. Equally, if part of us has faith in the Lord and part of us doubts, then again we are double-minded. We don't know whether to trust the Lord or not. Um, and it actually says, as we're going to look at very soon in James 1, um, that a person who doesn't really ask for things in faith when they pray uh, is a double-minded man unstable in all their ways is uh, quite sobering um, that we need to when we come to the Lord and pray have a heart that's full of faith rather than partly a faith and part doubt so when we are considering having pure hearts we need to make sure we are not double minded there's no mixture there the scripture speaks so much about avoiding mixture um, uh, not being partly devoted to the Lord and partly not so when we're thinking about that, it's good to remember it. And finally, um, Ben's verse, uh, which he mentioned, Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 51 is that psalm that David brings to the Lord after <coughs> he has been convicted about his sin with Bathsheba and um, arranging the death of uh, Uriah. Um, I don't know if you've done this much, but I know certainly when I've got things really wrong in my life, um, uh, various times in the past, uh, I have come to this psalm. And it's really comforted me, not just to think that if David did this and could be forgiven, that I could be, but just to know how to pray. Sometimes when we feel we've really messed up. And we don't know how to pray because we're so ashamed or, or feel so far from the Lord that we can come to Psalm 51 and, and um, speaks into our situation. But David asks the Lord to create in me a clean heart. And this is really where uh, my situation uh, comes in, really, um, which I just very simply want to share. Um, that as I was thinking about um, being set aside uh, within the church, um, uh, not wanting to dwell on, on me uh, in this message, but just to, just to share that as I was thinking about that, I felt a really strong conviction from the Lord that I needed, in the light of the psalm we've been looking at, uh, to prepare my heart and to make sure as much as possible that it was pure before I was to start to serve um, within the church. And so various times in, in the week or two running up to that Sunday morning, um, uh, I was really praying that the Lord would change my heart. Um, not, that I rec not that I thought that the Lord was going to change absolutely everything. Um, but in some particular areas, which I won't go into because it would be kind of hard to explain. But some particular areas of my heart that I knew needed to be dealt with. Particularly if I was able to then uh, serve others. That I needed those things um, to be changed. And the reason... I'm sharing this, uh, not in any way to draw attention, um, but just to say, the Lord has done it. I can honestly share tonight 
that in those areas where I really spent time asking the Lord and asking the Lord saying, Lord, I cannot change in these areas. These areas of my heart are so ingrained in me. And I really want to be changed come this particular Sunday. Uh, perhaps it helps to have a deadline because it focuses your prayer, doesn't it? it uh, rather than just praying, Lord, at some point will you do this? But I was really praying, would you change my heart? And honestly, and, and forgive me that I can't go into detail, but I can honestly stand there and say tonight, the Lord has changed my heart and changed it strongly for good um, in, in uh, particular areas. And, and I share it to say, if the Lord can do it for me, the Lord can do it for you. Um, and, and I hope that is an encouragement in some way uh, that I can stand here and say the Lord has done that and recently. Um, because yes, we said earlier that sometimes we need to incline our heart ourselves. Sometimes we need to say, no, I am going to love the Lord, and etc. But it's equally right to pray as David prayed, Lord, would you change my heart? Would you give me a fresh heart? In particular areas, I mean, you know, of course we can pray it generally. But to say, Lord, my attitude in this area is wrong. Would you change my attitude? Would you replace it with this attitude, which is more like the Lord? So the Lord can do it and he does do it. Um, and maybe having a deadline helps. So there we go. Not that we should set arbitrary deadlines, but, um, you know, particularly if there is something particular coming up and a particular time. For me, it was a particular time um, that was very clear when it felt like things need to be changed. But sometimes the Lord might say, you know, this is going to happen and I want you to be ready for it. And uh, good to be open to that. But I was also struck um, uh, in the Wednesday meeting, we met for prayer for the new session. Um, by the fact that actually we as a church are, are setting out in to some extent a new direction in some ways an extension of the old but we're looking to do new things um, we have uh, various changes that have happened and are happening um, and we're looking to be even more fruitful we pray for the Lord um, and so maybe the Lord would say to us uh, at this time you know before we start to be fruitful fruitful in those areas that the Lord wants to deal with things in our hearts um, individually um, because um, when we are dealt with individually the whole body profits doesn't it um, if one person's attitude in the fellowship changes it lifts the whole fellowship if one person turns around and says actually I'm willing to do this or I'm willing to put this behind me which was a problem we can feel the benefit and outsiders coming in can feel that as well. Um, and people around us in our lives can see a change, can't they? Um, and so as we come and, and we pray that the Lord will use us in these new areas, may the Lord change us individually in our hearts so that we are ready to be fruitful. Um, which is what we were saying um, in our last message on uh, the vine. About the, the fact that people like Moses and David and John the Baptist had a time of pruning, a time of cleansing, a time of purging perhaps, uh, before they then went into a time of fruitfulness. So perhaps something to consider. Anyway, we're briefly going to consider the, the rest of these couple of verses we're looking at in Psalm 24. The, um, the next thing, uh, after clean hands and a pure heart is not to have lifted up his soul to an idol. Uh, or, as other versions put it, uh, to falsehood uh, or to vanity. Um, I think it can be translated any of those ways. And in a sense, they're similar because if you worship an idol, you're worshipping vanity. There's, there's, there's no point to it. Um, and I always recently come back to the, the verse which um, I don't know if it was Anne or someone else shared recently about uh, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things uh, again in the New American Standard it's translated vanity turn away my eyes from looking at vanity um, and it's helpful to think of that but also a verse in Job uh, Job 15 verse 31 which says let him not trust in futile things deceiving himself for futility will be his reward. Or let him not trust in emptiness, 
for emptiness will be his reward. It really struck me to think, yeah, if we invest our time into what is worth nothing, then we're going to reap nothing. Really, it stands to reason, you know, what you sow, you will reap. Um, and so um, just briefly considering this, this, this idea that um, the person who comes to the Lord should not be lifting up their heart, their eye, their soul to vanity. Because if they are, then they have a divided heart. They haven't got a heart that is fully for the Lord because they think that um, vain things are worth spending time on. And finally, it talks about uh, not swearing deceitfully. Um, and again, if we're thinking about what these represent, clean hands, being free from sin, pure heart, having the right attitudes and desires, uh, lifting up soul to idol, not going after vain things, swearing deceitfully, perhaps what we say generally, um, that if we uh, have foul mouths or, or mouths that are forever spouting wrong things, we can't expect to be able to come into the Lord's presence. But uh, as we close, just to think about that fifth verse. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Well, I don't know if we often think to, uh, very often to, to, to ask for the Lord's blessing for ourselves. Um, perhaps we can get um, slightly too cautious because we see people around us in, in certain church movements claiming blessings. Um, which the scripture doesn't say we're necessarily entitled to. Um, but it is scriptural to ask the Lord to bless us. Um, not so that we can spend it on worthless things uh, or, 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 or anything like that, but it is scriptural to ask the Lord to bless our lives. And David says that if we clean our hands, purify our hearts, that we can receive the Lord's blessing and we can receive righteousness. And obviously we covered that this morning, didn't we, in our, in our worship, um, that the Lord can give us righteousness. Isaiah 54 verse 17, the Lord says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me. So as we close, we need to pray and ask the Lord that we might have clean hands and a pure heart, that we might not give our time over to vanity. To all those things which may seem important, but actually in the Lord's economy aren't so important at all. And we need to make sure the things we say are right. So that the Lord can bless our lives and give us his righteousness. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we know from scripture you say that you know our hearts, Lord. Um, and uh, Lord, that you search them to see if they are right in your sight. And Lord, though we know that there is very much in our hearts, Lord, and our ways which is uh, not pleasing to you still now, we would pray, would you search us out, Lord? Uh, Lord, not so that we can buckle under a weight of guilt, Lord, but so that we might seek your help to change in those areas, Lord. And we would pray, Lord, with David, Lord, would you create in us a new heart, Lord? Would you put in us the desires to seek you for changed hearts and attitudes in particular areas, Lord? You know the uh, ways that we have which are not pleasing to you. Would you put those on our hearts to seek you for help with, Lord? Because, Lord, we know, Lord, and, and would believe tonight, Lord, that you are willing and able to change us if we really seek you. So, Lord, would you help us, Lord? And as we do these things, may we know a closer relationship with you may we know the ability to enter into your presence and into your holy place and your holy home. <coughs> so we pray for your help lord in jesus name amen <laughs>